Hello learners, hope that you are keeping well. Uh, today's lesson is climate and weather and our focus is on mid-latitude cyclones. All right, I'm going to simplify it. I don't know why it's a challenge for, for learners, but the main thing is here is not just learning your workout. All right, and just putting it there, it's about applying it. And that's what makes this section actually simple. Okay, now, of course, we look at the general characteristics. I must just get my pen again. All right, my highlighter rather. We look at the general characteristics, areas of formation, conditions necessary for formation, stages of formation, associated weather, with each of these little cold front, warm front, occluded front conditions, uh, cyclone families, impact on the environment. We look at the case study, uh, precautionary measures and management strategies, uh, identification on a synoptic map, satellite images. Okay, we look at various of these things. Okay, and we'll go ahead and we'll simplify the thing for you. All right. Now, let's start off with the basics of our middle latitude cyclone. First of all, we need to know that there's alternate names, temperate cyclone, extratropical cyclone, frontal depression, wave cyclone. So these are various names that can be used for calling or naming middle latitude cyclones but the common one we find is always used in exams etc is the term mid latitude cyclones now we need to know that it is a low pressure system all right and it occurs in the middle latitudes of the earth usually around 30 to 60 degrees celsius Okay, when we look at it here, 30 to 60 degrees Celsius. In this region, it occurs, okay. Now, it occurs north and south of the equator on both sides, right, of the equator, you get this. Uh, two distinct characteristics, it's made up of a cold front, and a warm front. Don't mix. We find sometimes we talk about uh, about the eye, etc. This that's the tropical cyclone. Yeah, we have a cold front and a warm front. Uh, cold fronts reach and affect South Africa mostly in winter. We sometimes are getting them coming through in late summer, etc. When high pressure belts are in their northerly position. Now I'm going to show you here. Remember, your teachers would have told you about the ITCZ. When it's uh, summer in the Southern Hemisphere, remember the ITCZ moves southwards. All right? And when it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere, the ITCZ is found in the Northern Hemisphere. And the ITCZ, Intertropical Convergence Zone, is a low pressure area. So what happens when it's in the Southern Hemisphere, the ITCZ, the high pressures don't move up. Do you understand? So they stay in their southerly position because air moves from high pressure to low pressure. You understand? And when they, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere, then the ITCZ is obviously in the Northern Hemisphere and the high pressure systems will move towards this low pressure system and they'll be in a northerly position. And this explains it because if these high pressure systems are in their southerly position, especially the South Atlantic High, it's going to ridge and block the cold front from coming in. Okay? But if it's in its northerly positions, it's moving north, you understand? What happens now? It allows the cold front to come in and affect the country, okay? So that is why you have cold fronts affecting the country, mostly in winter, all right? And they bring in cold fronts, affect South Africa, uh, winter, in winter, bringing rainfall, 
like in the Western Cape, you find they receive winter rainfall because of the Mediterranean climate, obviously, and because of the cold fronts coming in and uplifting the warm air. You understand, creating condensation, cloud cover, and uh, the uh, rainfall occurs. All right. And there, whoa, a gremlin creeped in here. All right, wrong. It moves from west to, to east, okay? Not east to west. I apologize for that. From west to east, all right? So it moves from here west towards east sometimes it's also known as southwest to northeast but the general direction is from west to east so i'm going to put a red line here no my apologies i'm now getting mixed up okay so it moves from west to east we'll talk a little bit more about it all right as we go through the formation and we find that what actually happens here, just in a brief, and I know it's not uh, really making sense at the moment when I say the warm front bends southwards away from the cold front. You understand in a way? So therefore, it does not affect South Africa. Okay, I'll go into a little bit more detail of this later on. Okay, so we basically can sum up from here that the cold front affects our country, South Africa, and not the warm front. Okay, and I've got it right here. It moves from west to east. My apologies, learners. It's my gray hair down here that's actually made twice and put in the tropical cyclone movements. So I do apologize for that. Okay. Right, so, but it's good actually on one hand that I showed you the difference already. I'm trying to make excuses. Okay, so it moves from west to east. Right, now, how does it form? Okay, how does it form? Now, if we take this area here, all right, the subpolar low, we've learned along this area is the polar front okay the polar front it's not totally stationary although on many occasions it's considered stationary All right now that's the polar front it forms at the polar front it starts to form okay that's what we must remember now what happens here warm moist air from the subtropical high there we have it here the warm moist air is coming in, all right, towards the subpolar low, all right, uh, which actually has warm moist air, uh, pressure belt. It meets with the cold, dry, polar high pressure air, all right, at the polar front. Can you see? There's the cold, dry polar air moving in here. Obviously, it's being deflected, right, due to the rotation of the Earth and Coriolis force. So what do we have here now? Warm, moist air from the subtropical high uh, cell and cold, dry air from the polar cell. They meet on both sides of the polar front, all right? These masses blow past each other in opposite directions. So if I look at this, it's flowing this way, all right? And if I look at this, it's flowing in the other direction. So we have two uh, and opposite directions on both sides of the polar front. Then a disturbance is created along the polar front which causes unstable air. So what happens along the polar front? There's a disturbance, a bend. You understand? Oh, I can make a bend like that. Okay, so what happens? There's the cold air moving here. All right, as shown down here. And there's the warm air moving this way. Can you see it? 
it moves southwards. This disturbance, this bend, all right, will then cause the cold air to come in here and force some of the warm air up here. And if it does that, you understand, unstable air is moving up, all right? This creates a low pressure around that point. Because once air is uplifted, you will find a low pressure being created. That is your start now. Obviously, when this starts happening, it results in a circulation of air. Obviously, you can see the cold air on this side moving warmer that side, and you can see a clockwise direction. Okay, because the warm air is pushed further south, and the cold air is moving more northwards. Okay, and that starts the circulation. I want to draw something here. Okay. And there's it moving that way and that way. Now the circulation has started in that area. And then you start getting your middle attitude cyclone starting to form. Okay, we just got a rough idea there. That is why we had to bring in our grade 11 work to look at it. And this obviously is in the westerly belt. Okay, you've done that in grade 11. Okay, let's go further now. Let's look at the stages. Okay, now I know there's a debate. We call it the initial stage, and we always debate this. Nothing has really happened. This is how the flow happens at the polar front, but we're not going to look at it that way. We're going to call it the first stage. All right, now you already saw that the warm air from the uh, subtropical high coming in, the cold polar air. We're not showing the deflection here, yeah? but that's how it comes in. They're flowing in opposite directions, all right? So we say there is a boundary, the polar front, separating the warm air to the north. Okay, that's in the north. From the cold air to the south, that's your polar air coming in. The air masses do not mix. They're on both sides of the polar front, all right? And air moves parallel to each other. Can you see? This one in this direction as shown by the arrow, and this one in this direction, the cold, dry air, all right, from the polar. So they move more or less parallel to each other in opposite directions, okay? Can you see it again, opposite directions? The polar front is often stationary. It stays in one place, not always, all right? The polar front can move. It's not always at 60 degrees, so it can move. But on many occasions, it can be considered stationary. But overall, it's not always stationary. We must remember that, all right? Now, what's gonna happen, all right? This is when the cyclone really starts to form the middle latitude cyclone. And we say a wave forms on the polar front. All right, there's the wave here. Can you see it? All right, it can be surface obstructions also, but one of the big things that actually cause this wave, all right, uh, in the upper level, sorry, uh, a wave forms in the polar front as an upper level disturbance embedded in the jet streams. So upper air disturbance happens here. All right, can be surface also, but the upper level. And now this jet stream will cause a disturbance. What is a jet stream? All right, uh, jet streams are currents of high above the earth. They are found there. They move eastwards at altitudes of eight to 15 kilometers. So there it's moving eastwards, all right? these jet streams and as they move all right they create a disturbance here all right it moves over the front over the polar front can you see it moving there all right and the front develops a curve all right it moves eastwards all right develops a curve okay 
where the wave is developing, the bend and the wave is developing. Of course, the warm air is now uplifted because of the curve, the cold air is moving in northwards, southwards, and warm air gets uplifted, all right? Pressure decreases here, yeah? all right? Pressure de decrease in pressure, all right? And you can see clearly here because the air is rising, so the pressure is decreasing. In the southern hemisphere, cold air moves northwards. Can you see the cold air now? It's moving this way because the disturbance has been created. The wave is there. It's moving northwards. And the warm air moves southwards as i showed you earlier i'm repeating myself but it's good that we do that because it's pushed like that all right of course the opposite is true for the northern hemisphere in the sense that uh it, it's facing that way all right so we have a situation where the cold front if it's sitting like that and we have a disturbance then the cold front will move southwards okay southwards right precipitation starts to occur and heaviest along the frontal boundary along this area so we already start having precipitation in this area all right so that's the development then we reach the mature stage now first of all you see the wave there and you see two distinct fronts here now they are completely uh, away from each other all right can you still see the northward movement here and the eastward movement of that due to the disturbance when the jet streams came in all right so it's clear it's distinct we have two clear distinct fronts cold front warm front and that's how you know it's in the mature stage. They do meet at the apex at the low pressure. So cold air moves quickly northwards. There's it moving rapidly now, all right? Forcing the warm front southwards. And the warm front moves gently, all right? Because it's also not, you must remember, this pressure gradient is steeper at the cold front because it's cold dense you understand so it moves a steeper gradient you understand there's more movement and of course it's warmer at the warm front so the gradient is more gentle a slower movement all right southwards okay obviously it's the opposite in the northern hemisphere okay there is a, a clearly defined cold front and warm front and warm sector. So there you can see clear. There's no mixing like this, warm, cold, whatever. It's clear, it's just a cold front. I call them the thorns, you can see it there. And a clear warm front. This is the mature stage. I call them the semicircles. And in between the warm sector clearly show all right clearly show okay rainfall occurs with the heaviest rainfall along the cold front remember the cold front has got a steep pressure gradient i'll do that in a little more detail when we look at the cross section also steep pressure gradient you understand so it's gonna if it's a steep pressure gradient watch my hands there's the warmer here it comes in and lifts this rapid upliftment all right of the warmer air in front because of this steep pressure gradient and pushes it up that is why you'll find cumulonimbus clouds etc forming here but we'll talk about that later all right uh, so heaviest rainfall along the cold front due to the upliftment and i would like to say rapid upliftment of the warm air so it's heavier you will get rain at the warm front but it'll be less. You get uh, consistent rainfall, soaking rainfalls, etc. Then we have the next stage, which is the occluded stage. Now, what happens here? Remember, the cold front is moving faster than the warm front. You know why now. 
to keep a pressure going and, and whatever. So what happens is the cold front moving faster than the warm front catches up with the warm front. Can you see it here? Catches up with the warm front. Do you understand? Can you see them here? Yeah, clearly indicated. All right. And then the cold front overtakes the warm front, forming an occluded front. You understand? Generally, the term occlusion means the upliftment of warming. You understand? So in all types of occlusions, you must remember warm air is uplifted. You understand? Or the warmer air is uplifted. Sometimes you get a mistake. We think warm, we talk 20 degrees or whatever. Let's put it the warmer air is uplifted. And then of course, last one, and I don't have a diagram for it because now the cyclone doesn't exist anymore. So we have the dissipating stage. Yeah, the warm air, all the warm air is uplifted from the ground. So the warm air is gone. What stays at the ground now? It's the cold air. Of course, pressure will increase. You understand? And there's no low pressure now, okay? Because all the warm air has been pushed up. And then what happens is the cyclone dissipates. Well, finished. And of course, rainfall will cease because there's no more warm air rising. Okay, and therefore the cyclone is gone. Okay, now let's look at the cross section of this. Okay, I showed you a view of how it look, cold front, all right, warm front, all right. This is the occlusion, but I'm showing you here, cold front, warm front, okay. It works like that. And depending where you're talking about, why I put these two diagrams, if you get a cross section, we ask you draw a cross section and you look at this and you say occlusion, you understand? Also must draw an occluded front. Watch where the examiner is asking you to draw the cross section. And if you look here, He's asking you, or she's asking you from A to B. Is there any occlusion at A to B? No. So watch, be careful about that. If it was down here, it was a different story. There's an occlusion. But it's A to B. There's no occlusion occurring there. The warm front, the cold front, and the warm front are separated. Now, learners. Please, you guys lose marks. You do everything correctly when an examiner asks you to draw uh, or uh, your teacher asks you in the test or whatever to draw a cross section. You do everything. But what do you do wrong? You draw the symbols, yeah. You understand? No. Once you draw the symbols, then it becomes the symbols. It's not a cross section. Notice. It's just a line and it's labeled as the cold front, warm front. Obviously, you want to do red and, and blue if you want to, you can do so. In terms of a cross section, you just have a pen in front of you. It doesn't matter about the colors. Okay, so please note that. Okay, that it's just lines representing them, not those thorns as I call them, or semicircles. It's incorrect. You get no marks for that. Okay, we've got that clear. See, let's start off with this cold front. All right, we can see down there, there's this cold front. Okay, so cold front. Pressure gradient at the cold front is steep. You can see it. It's steep because of the cold air. You understand? It's steep. All right, resulting in rapid uplift of warm air. All right, when the steep gradient comes in like a bulldozer. All right, and forces this warm air up. So there's rapid uplift. And it does rapid uplift, upliftment. There's, it goes to a higher extent. And as it cools, it's going to form a cloud of vertical extent. Cumulonimbus clouds. Can you see? That is why you get your big clouds in those areas. All right. Obviously, right, the temperature decreases because it's a cold front coming in. The pressure decreases 
because if the air is uplifted at this point, there's less air here, am I right? Resulting in a low pressure. That's how you read it, all right? I know many resources you have, just says pressure decreases, but why? Because the air is getting uplifted. Therefore, less air here, pressure decreases. With the cold sector, all right? Uh, but increases with the cold sector. As it says warmed up, then the cold sector comes in, there's more air near the surface, less rising air, obviously the pressure will decrease, or increase rather, because now it's subsiding, so the pressure increases. Humidity decreases because of this air coming in here, the cold front, you understand, and the cold sector, all right, Cloud cover increases because all the moisture is being forced up. You understand this condensation and this cumulonimbus numbers cloud is forming. So cloud cover increases and you get this cumulonimbus numbers clouds because A is rapidly uplifted. So we get this cloud of vertical extent. Chances of precipitation increases. It can be heavy rainfall, snow that may happen all right over these areas. All right. So Precipitation increase, you can get heavy rainfall. We'll do a case study later, you'll see that. All right, it can be heavy rainfall, snow happening, etc. All right, even due to veering and backing, wind direction changes. All right, veering and backing. Now, what is that? Okay, uh, veering is when warm air, all right, uh, due to advection. All right, actually has a change and it turns anti-clockwise, all right, in the southern hemisphere as it rises. It turns anti-clockwise in the atmosphere. That is veering, all right, anti-clockwise and in the southern hemisphere. And backing, when cold air advection takes place, there is a clockwise circulation in the southern hemisphere. So veering changes anti-clockwise as the warm air advection occurs when the liquid moves in the atmosphere horizontally. You understand, you get a anti-clockwise and with the cold air advection, you have a clockwise circulation. Now these changes actually change the direction of the movement of the air, all right? Of course, the opposite is in the Northern Hemisphere, all right? Northern Hemisphere has the opposite. Veering is uh, clockwise, backing is anti-clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. And because of these movements, the winds get stronger, all right? Stronger, because directions are changing at times and the winds get stronger. That is basically your cold front situations. In the warm sector, there's decrease in wind speeds, all right, because it's warm. There's not much upliftment happening here until the cold front comes in. You understand? So it's just warm conditions, and if it's warm, there's not much upliftment wind speeds are low, all right? Calmer conditions, because wind speeds are low, therefore it'll be calmer conditions, right? It's not moving. Possibility of sun drizzle, if there's a little condensation, but sometimes we have no rainfall here, and a higher humidity here, because the air is moist, there's not much condensation, so the humidity is higher. Can you see what I'm doing to this? I'm making sense of it. Let's look at the warm front now. And you see the warm front, the pressure gradient at the warm front is gentle. And if you notice this, steep pressure gradient here. Can you see it like the bulldozer, as I always say? It's a steep pressure gradient. It's forcing rapid upliftment. But yeah, it is gentle. It's can see the gentle gradient here. So what happens here? 
it rises along this front okay it rises all right so as it rises obviously it's going to cool and cause some rainfall so temperature increases because it is the warm front pressure will decrease because air is rising therefore there's less air here not such a rapid movement but still air is moving up so pressure will decrease humidity increases because as the air moves all right and then cloud cover occurs because as it moves up you understand it cools and condenses but you're not going to get this huge cloud here you're going to get more of a horizontal i would say at an angle it can't be totally horizontal but you'll get a more one stretching out and that is your nimbo stratus clouds right precipitation here is soft soaking rainfalls difference eh? from the cold front with the steep pressure gradient rapid upliftment here the air rises along the warm front so you've got different type of rainfall everything you have reasons for and it makes things simpler to understand okay i've got a little diagram here that shows you the different types of clouds can you see it cumulonimbus numbers here this shows you a better vertical extent it shows you the anvil shape etc okay so that is your cross section and the weather stations. All right, now the occluded stage, and you know an occlusion takes place when warmer air is uplifted. I'd like to change that to warmer air. All right, warmer, I want to add that R, E, R to here, warmer air okay so i don't get a misconception it's 20 some odd degrees whatever it can be much lower but it is warmer than the other air all right warmer air is uplifted that's an occlusion all right now let's look at it we've got two types of occlusions a cold front and a warm front occlusion i learn as you i don't know why you find a difficulty in this but let's look at some simple things in identification all right you know that's the cold front that's the warm front right that's the cold front that's the warm front here okay the warm front here now one way of identifying it is if it's a cold front occlusion it seems like the cold front is touching the surface can you see it if it's a warm front occlusion the warm front is touching the surface. That's one thing that you can identify. And if, there, if any time a question like that comes out, then you know, hey, cold front, warm front occlusion. All right? So warm front, cold front touching, cold front occlusion, warm front touching, warm front occlusion. Right, now let's look a little bit more at this cold front occlusion. Results when the statically more stable air behind you understand the cold front okay uh so this now if you look at it there all right the cold front now undercuts the warm front okay so we say is more stable is colder all right when we say the statically more stable a eh, this means it's very cold can you see it and it's cold here yeah. All right so this air relatively is warmer than that air okay so what actually happens here is because this air is heavy it's stable a steep pressure gradient okay what it's going to do it's going to go and undercut the warm front and as it goes through it undercuts and pushes the air up okay in the occlusion stage that's a cold front occlusion okay cold air from cold front coming through all right because it's more stable it's colder it's forcing the warm air up it's going underneath undercutting 
and pushing it up. That is why it's touching the surface. With the warm front occlusion, now watch this. When the cold air behind the occluded front is warmer, can you see? It's cool here and it's cold here. Can you see it? So behind here, it's cooler and cold. So relatively, this air is warmer than this air. So what happens now? Then the air ahead of it, can you see cold, cool? So what happens now? In the warm occlusion, acts in a similar way to a warm front. The cold air behind the front is less dense. Can you see it? Because it's cooler and that's cold then even the colder air above it, it's colder here. So it passes over the colder air. So because this is colder, it's more stable. And this is cooler behind the occluded front. So what happens with this air? It goes over the colder air. And that is why the warm front touches the surface okay so again both cases the so-called warmer air is pushed up you understand yeah this is the warmer air the cold front is more stable the air behind it is more stable it undercuts and forces the warm air up yeah the air behind the system is cool and the air head is cold so the cooler air rises above Okay, it overrides the colder air, it goes over. Okay, I can understand, it's quite a complex thing, guys. But you remember those simple things, I've spent a little time on it now. Remember that to identify alone again, the cold front is touching the surface, cold front occlusion. The warm front is touching the surface, warm front occlusion. Yeah, the air behind is colder. So it uplifts the air or undercuts the air in front of it, of the warm front, which has a higher temperature. Yeah, it's behind. The air is cooler and the air head is, uh, is cool and the air head is cold, lower temperature, and therefore the cooler air overrides. It goes over and rises. Okay, I've spent a lot of time and your data on that. Okay. Right, let's look at some synoptic interpretations, etc. Now, can you see here the dense cloud cover, learners? That is your cold front. You can see the cumulonimbus clouds, dense cloud cover. All right, uh, that's your cold front hitting southern Africa here. Can you see it? All right, there's another one coming in down here. You can see that white patch. All right, there it is down here. And this one has come through. Can you see it here? How the synoptic map is made by looking at the satellite. And you can clearly see the high pressures are in the northerly positions. Can you see that? So it's allowing the cold fronts to come in. So this is more typical of a summer condition. What do you notice about the weather symbols down here, where the cold front is it? It's completely black in color, all right, because it shows you cloud cover, cumulonimbus clouds. Can you see it? Cumulonimbus clouds as it's moving. Yeah, you may see some clear patches. I do apologize, not very clear the, the, the map itself, but you see some clearer patches, partially cloudy, etc. Okay, because the cold front has not gone there yet. Okay, so when, when the symbols will show changing in wind speeds, greater wind speeds, all right, overcast conditions. All right, so this is your summer, northerly position. All right, uh, it shows you another one here, a satellite photograph. Can you see the band of clouds here, cold front? The band of clouds here, cold front, it's now moved over, cold front. You understand? Brilliant. If you look at these satellite images from here, the synoptic map is made. All right. I found this one very enjoyable. All right. Because this is the bugger, as I say. This one is the South Atlantic high is very strong. And this is the one that ridges. 
Okay, look at this one. This Kalahari High is doing some ridging here. Okay. So it's quite unusual that you see that, and it's blocking to a certain extent. You notice they're starting to move north, eh? They're starting to move north, learners, to a certain extent. So if I had to look at the season of this, this uh, higher order, it's towards the latter part of your winter season. So they still, uh, uh, it's starting to, uh, sorry, your, your winter season is moving towards your, summer season all right it's moving towards your spring and then your summer i'm forgetting my seasons also okay so it's starting to move up but there's still some blocking and i found this to be interesting how the kalahari high is doing some blocking mostly this one does the blocking of the when it reaches of the cold fronts okay and you look at the word here learners family of fronts when there's a few uh, uh, mid-latitude cyclones coming in, we call it a family of mid-latitude cyclones. So I'm going to change this word France. I'm going to cross and call it family of mid-latitude cyclones. When there's few, like there's three mid-latitude cyclones, it is a family of mid-latitude cyclones that's occurring. A few, like three, occurring in the area look at this a beautiful occlusion is starting hey eh? can you see it? this is in the mature stage of this area all right although this is older than this why is it older than this because it moves from west to east you understand therefore this one will be older than this one that we have here Okay, that's also working out which one is older and which one is newer. West to east. Okay, some interesting stuff there. Ah, we can see a nice one here. All right, we can see a beautiful one here. And what is this? Clearly, you notice your high pressure systems are in the southerly position. All right, so it's more summer conditions, eh? And it's, can you see the ridging? This one does the most, it ridges okay and blocks the cold fronts from affecting the country it's going to push it further south okay so typical sort of uh summer conditions even this one we don't mustn't forget about this one is also doing some ridging the south indian high and blocking it from coming in all right so these are some things and if you look at these summer winter conditions then you get a brilliant idea on a synoptic map how it looks okay and then lastly i want to look at this okay i'm not trying to make my face bigger i'm not that important look at the cold front brings rain and winds and floods to the western cape you can see it here the amount of water gale force northwesterly winds of 65 to 80 kilometers so it can bring strong winds that backing and fearing changing the direction of the winds all right i expected between table bay and cape agalas and the cape metropolitan wildlands central Karoo. see the area that it covers moderating in the evening cooling off heavy rains leading to localized flooding is possible over the cape uh, metropole the western parts of the Cape Winelands, large areas. Look at this, high seas with wave heights of six to seven meters are expected between Cape Columbine and Cape Agullis. So it can be very destructive. It can destroy uh, whether it's the, the farming, uh, road networks, uh, people's homes, especially living in informal settlements, uh, damaging the natural environment. So it can do a lot of things and damage. But we must also remember that sometimes it brings good rains. So it can have a positive effect. You understand? It brings in good rains, which allow for crops to grow, natural vegetation, water supply. So it can be positive depending on the intensity of the rainfall and winds etc so it can be positive even your snow you understand can be positive people love to see snow tourism etc which is brilliant for the economy of the area 
all right, the farming of the area. So it can have a positive or negative effect. Learners, I hope you enjoyed the lesson. I'm not putting any questions here. You've got loads of past papers. I've done some revision lessons also on YouTube, which you can refer to. So I hope you enjoyed it. All the best. Goodbye.